Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and I'm still up in Marquette outside of my studio and I just don't feel like coming on camera. So you get another cartoon Bob today. Our subject is going to be Nathan Oakley, my favorite flat earther. Not because I'm picking on him, but because he's so fun just to take apart being the smug, ignorant person that he is. So, let's go ahead and cue up the music and see Nathan Oakley and how he approaches arguing against the globe. Now, in this episode of Ball Busters, Nathan Oakley is going to outline his strategy for arguing with people that understand science and the shape of the Earth. All right, everyone, let's roll. What we have to do is get everything right. We have to define the words that they're using on the ball side. Then we got to pose them in good questions, and we've got to break down all the errors when we see them. Uh, all they do is go with, as, as Nathan has always said, 99% or 95% of the Western world believes what they believe, but no one could defend it. They absolutely cannot That's defend what, what they I believe. So we come here... And the uh, omen is on us because we have to be right because we're fighting the majority of people's beliefs. So we have to have proof. Well, folks, that was a bold statement, and I'm glad the panelists came out with it right away. This outlines their entire strategy for defeating the globe Earth. Now, notice he said some very specific things. Number one, define the words that Globers use. They want to own the definitions of those words and they will define them as needed to support their narrative, but give them an out to claim that when it's used to support the globe, it's being used incorrectly according to their definition. We call this the semantics argument of the flat earth. The second is very carefully composed questions and statements. An example of that will be a flat earther coming out and saying, I don't know what the shape of the earth is, but it's not a globe. Notice that they are not making a claim that the earth is flat. And the reason that they won't make a claim that the earth is flat is then they can be challenged. If the earth is flat, there is never a time that a horizon could appear in front of an object. The horizon must by necessity always be behind all objects that we are looking at because it's true, it's simple geometry. And then finally, what they do is when you try and make a statement, they will either interrupt you, they will try and force you to a different subject, or they will take words that you use completely out of context and try and dismiss your argument that way. An example of that is, say Nathan comes out and says, I don't know what the moon is. I could return and say, well, I do know what the moon is because we've been there and we've brought back samples of the moon. Nathan's counter to that is not challenging the validity of my samples. His counter is, oh, you have personally been to the moon because you said we have been to the moon. That's like we have gone to the movies. You're part of that group. When in reality, the context of the statement was we as in mankind of which I am a member have been to the moon. Now the next statement that he makes is to try and put everybody else on the defensive and portray the flat earther as a heroic crusader for the truth. 95 to 99 percent of all of the western world believes that the earth is a sphere. They're one of the 5 to 1 percent that believe otherwise and that makes them somehow right. Well, there's a reason that 95 to 99 percent of all people believe that the Earth is a sphere. It's because indeed it is measurably a sphere. It can also be tested by the scientific method. Not the scientific method as they define it, which is the outline of an experiment we teach to middle school students, but the actual scientific method. The actual scientific method involves asking a question. Why is the bottom of Mount San Jacinto not visible and seemingly below the horizon when viewed from Malibu, California, some 123 miles away. Then the next part of the scientific method is to propose an answer to that. And the answer that we will propose is that the surface of the earth is curved. 
then what we can do is we can make a prediction based on that proposed answer. And that is, if the earth is curved this much, this much of the mountain will be below the horizon and we won't be able to see it. We can then test that prediction by observing the mountain from Malibu, California and noting the lowest point on the mountain that we can see above the horizon. And then we can compare it to our prediction. We can also look at the alternative prediction and that is that the Earth is a flat plane. When viewed from Malibu, California, if the Earth was a flat plane, Mount San Jacinto would be visible from the peak all the way down to the base, including the towns that are around the base, which we can't see in the J. Tolman Media One photograph. Therefore, flat Earth is simply ruled out. It can't occur based on that one photograph alone. And there is innumerable examples of evidence that also rule out the flat Earth, but that's the one that I'm going to talk about in this particular section. So let's move on to his next argument. Yesterday they were arguing about the uh, the sun not changing size. What does that what what does that prove? To you? Okay, so that argument breaks down as follows. They're asking you why does the not actual size of the sun not change its not actual size as it moves from its not actual location? Except, of course, that is not the argument that's being made. Nathan is creating a straw man by restating the argument that is being made in his own form and then arguing against his own argument in support of the flat earth. The first part is the question, to a stationary observer on the earth, why does the sun appear to move position during the day? Now the proposed answer is that the earth is flat and stationary, the sun is small and local, and moves independently of the surface of the earth above it. The prediction that needs to be made from that is that according to the rules of perspective, as the sun moves away from the observer, it will become smaller. And as the sun moves towards the observer, it will become larger. The test is to measure the angular size of the sun at various times during the day and see if it changes size. Now this of course has been done and the sun does not in fact change in angular size throughout the day. Now if we make an alternative hypothesis and that is that the earth is a planet orbiting around the sun at 93 million miles, the sun will appear to move through the sky as the earth rotates underneath it and the angular size of the sun will not change because the actual distance from the observer to the sun throughout the day will not change by a significant amount. 4,000 miles out of 94 million miles is not going to lead to a detectable change in the angular size of the sun. When we do the measurements, that is indeed what we find. Therefore, real observations of the sun favor the rotating Earth in orbit around a distant sun versus a stationary Earth with a small local sun moving over it. So now we're getting into another technique that Nathan likes to use, and that is the word salad technique. What he does is he takes something that is perfectly understandable. If you have a glowing object in the sky and it moves away from you, it will get smaller by the rules of perspective. If it moves towards you, it will get larger. He doesn't want to argue against that because he cannot win that argument. So what he does is he starts trying to confound this and put a word salad of terms out. The apparent size of the not sun, which is not moving because we don't know where it is and therefore we're only seeing not the image of the sun, but the refracted image of the sun, which is not anything that we can define. Therefore we can just toss it out. This is the word salad spaghetti response. Throw everything up against the wall, see what sticks, see what the person that you're arguing with stumbles over, and then attack that weakness. It doesn't work on people that actually pay attention. I can only credit <laughs> QE is just, just had a, one of your arguments I had to break down 
Why does the not actual size of the sun not change in not actual size as it moves from its not actual position? It was something that was posed to somebody by Sean Hawkins, I believe. QE. Good to have you, by the way. Good morning. Morning. QE. John. But yeah, I remember me. Remember me four years ago. Now that you're talking about that non-actual size change of this, yeah, the sun and all that. I brought that up very early on <laughs> as my argument for a holographic nature. Remember, and then you were all getting all very confused at me, and even thought that it was might have been controlled opposition after all. Remember all that? I don't think that would have been me. That might have been Anthony Riley. Well, Nathan, great way to throw your buddy under the bus. But this is another technique of debate that the Flat Earth uses all the time, and that is they are treating this statement, this unfounded statement that they have, that we don't know what the sun is, that we don't know where it is, we don't know its size, etc., 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 as a fact, and then using that as a premise to make their argument. They haven't established that those are facts to begin with. We know exactly what the sun is. We know exactly how far away it is. We can accurately measure the angular size of the sun at will. Any of us can do that if we have the proper equipment. And the proper equipment consists of a solar filter and a camera. Now the reason that Nathan probably did that and tossed Anthony Riley under the bus was he realized that that was a stupid argument and didn't want to be associated with it. He wanted to put the blame on somebody else. Normally, I would think that he would put that on a ball earther or a scientist, but it probably caught him a little bit off guard because Arwen has a way of doing that. And he just lashed out at the first target that he saw. Well, I hope you found that little discussion of Nathan's debate techniques and how he tries to control the conversation and the debate by playing these semantic games and actually employing logical fallacies himself while claiming that it's his opponent doing the logical fallacies and constantly talking over and interrupting. You see that when his own panel starts pointing out facts and trying to argue things based on facts, he immediately cuts them off you see how quickly he admonishes them to keep their arguments as ill-defined and vaporous as possible. Because if you don't actually present a claim or an argument, it can't be countered. You can just assert things, and you're asserting them from a position of ignorance. It's very difficult to argue against a phantom, and that's the only way that you can engage in people that actually understand the shape of the earth, science, reality, whatever you want to call it, is to not give them a target that they can attack while you constantly chip away at their arguments and take targets of opportunity. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Marquette, Michigan. Thank you very much for joining me today. Hey, make sure you hit that like and subscribe. We've got a store now. We've got channel memberships and even a Patreon. Be it something as simple as clicking a button or sharing a video, or if you want to support the channel, you'll go towards making this channel better. So until we talk again, this is Bob the Science Guy. Take care, guys.